So we're transitioning into the next hour um, at two o'clock. That was, boy, we've just had such a variety of reflections and directions. And uh, so I'm grateful. I hope everyone else is as grateful as well. Um, so our next hour, as you can see, will be some more reflections from within the Protestant community. But, uh, and we've had some, some uh, attachments along the way to uh, social work, but we'll probably hear a little bit more about that in the next hour. Um, I wanna lift up gratitude for people who have been participating in this, people who've been watching this, but also to the people who brought this all about. Um, I wanna thank the, our mayor for having the idea and uh, convening us this morning, and he'll be back again later. But I also want to thank the team, and you're seeing all of them at work. So all the co-hosts that are helping, Vance and Wendy and Mamet and all those folks you've been seeing, they've been helping to plan and coordinate. But our technology is all being powered by the San Antonio Community Resource Directory. Okay. And if you're familiar with it, and we affectionately call it sacred.org. It's one letter short of sacred, but that's where you can check it out online. Um, but it's just a, a culmination and we've been working on it for several years now of congregations and nonprofits and governmental agencies and compassionate groups, everyone who is offering any type of um, human service and care to the community. And especially now we're also making sure that everything there is up to date. So those folks are really needing volunteers and that work is done at home, so it's perfect timing for that. So if anybody is available and wanting to find something very productive that provides the most direct service to the direct services in our city, um, you can see the email there at info at sacred.org. Uh, it's also a good place that if you have other uh, ongoing thoughts or ideas or questions beyond the conversation, you could probably send them there and they'll call those out. Um, so kind of the disclaimer going into the next hour and every hour is to remember that uh, we are live and online. So once you're here, you're not as anonymous as you used to be <laughs> you're free and to come and go at will. And you know that look at this, the virtual society is still a free moving one, right? Um, Zoom does have the potential of just failing and coming to an end. If that happens, just take a big deep breath and Bill with sacred.org will reboot the whole thing and you can come back and sign back in. Um, so just keep that in mind. And one of the things that I've been doing is collecting one-liners um, from of one-liners of, of wisdom that I've been hearing from each uh, hour. And so I'll read those, you know, because I know we have new viewers, but it helps me to reflect. Um, so from the mayor this morning, we heard, we're all in this together. The sun also rises. And then earlier from within the indigenous conversation, we're all relatives. And then uh, one of our local saints, <laughs> Sister Martha Ann Kirk, people were people together taking care of each other. And then Pastor Garland was talking about um, panic attacks and some of the wisest words that you can say are, I love you, I'm here for you. And I would suggest that's good all the time. And during that same time from Tino, our immigration liaison, what is the world we want to see? And to be working there. And then moving more into our Muslim wisdom that we heard, do your part and the pieces come together. Tie your camel and then trust the rest will happen. Uh, and that it's, it is about us. It's not about me or you. It's about us. And then just in this last one that ties right to that um, is from Commissioner Calvert, our collective our we is going to die and be reborn. Um, and someone else said, one day you'll tell stories. We'll tell stories about this and that this will not be forever. So uh, a hopeful day uh, for me and I hope for you as well. 
And so for our next conversation, uh, our next reflection time, we're gonna turn it back over to our co-host, Wendy Holbrook. Uh, some more reflections from within the Protestant traditions and some connectivity uh, with social work as well. And I hand it over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Anne. And I welcome Patty and Paul and my new friend, Abel. So this is the first time I've seen Abel face to face, sort of, or as close as I'm going to get for a while. So, hey, great to meet you um, up close and personal, virtually. Good to see you. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves, tell us about your work in the field of whether it's social justice, social work, social ministry, all those things kind of tie together, as well as share your faith tradition with us, if you would, please. And Abel, looks like you're lit up on my screen, so we're going to ask you to go first. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Abel Vega, and I'm uh, with the United Methodist Church, specifically the Rio Texas Conference uh, and office here in San Antonio, and I'm Director of Mission, uh, Service, and Justice. And Patty? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I uh, also wanted to echo what uh, Anne was saying about all the thank yous to Mayor Nuremberg, the city leaders, of course, and to yourself and Wendy and putting this all together. Uh, so I have the privilege of being on this panel today um, with a variety of roles. So I have been a social worker for, in April, it's going to be 43 years. Um, I've done direct practice and have been a supervisor and I'm currently a professor adjunct in uh, the Baptist University of Americas. Uh, also the privilege of being co-founder of the Christian Latina Leadership Institute to develop uh, and replicate the things I've been privileged of in being a leader. So I'm glad to be here. Beautiful, thank you. And Paul Puricara, I think you're out there somewhere. I am. Can you hear me? Can you see me? I can hear you. But you can't see me. I don't yet, but. Okay, I can see myself. So uh, I'm Oh, I can see you now. I, I see said to find you in the, the stream. Very good. Uh, in terms of my background, I think what might be interesting is uh, that uh, I was raised in a household with a Buddhist father, a Baptist mother who became Jewish. And of course, they raised me as Southern Baptist. Um, so even now, when I uh, attend my uh, Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, which I have for the last 40 years, I tend to sing some of my hymns like country western songs. Um, <laughs> I've been uh, involved with uh, social work since uh, graduating uh, and going into VISTA as a VISTA volunteer for two years. Uh, first year in Florida with the migrants and second year with the mental health program in West Virginia. And that led to my uh, deciding to uh, become an army social worker. I was an army social worker for 20 years and then uh, was a social worker with the San Antonio Police Department in setting up the uh, domestic violence uh, program and then for uh, eight years, uh, I uh, ran a uh, nonprofit, a camp for uh, youngsters and adults with uh, severe uh, disabilities. Um, recently, I'm been involved with uh, uh, volunteering and have just enjoyed that thoroughly. I currently am on the San Antonio Housing Commission as uh, one of the areas that uh, uh, is uh, 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 making, I think, good use of my time. <laughs> and Paul, I know you, and I know you make excellent use of your time. So <laughs> I don't doubt that in the least. Well, speaking of the use of our time and the fact that everyone's time has shifted, I've certainly come to understand that though some people may be saying they're trying to fill their time, and others are overwhelmed with so many things to do at this point. Taking this time today for reflection, as well as our own individual commitment to reflection, I, I want to stress, or not stress, but ask about that for a moment. And I'll start with you, Abel. 
Why is it important to have a day of reflection? Does reflection change things for you? Yeah, well, uh, this is kind of interesting because this day of reflection happens to fall on my birthday. And uh, so, <laughs> Happy birthday. Oh, that, yes, that, indeed. That, we did that, it just think, for uh, you. <laughs> well, I, I think so, you know, probably, you know, we tend to be reflective just, you know, as we as we hit another year of life, giving thanks for that. But I think now even more so in the midst of, of the times uh, that we're in. So I think that, um, you know, while birthdays can accentu accentuate reflection, uh, you know, and gratitude, uh, you know, th this is also just a time of, of wondering and, and uh, you know, in, in terms of just the pandemic uh, and as we just see things unfold. So I think, I think that um, this day, this moment is, is important. I think uh, it probably uh, can speak out you know, to just our city in general, in terms of just uh, modeling the importance of reflecting. Thank you, Ben. Um, I, and I forgot to mention, you asked a question about the faith perspective. And I grew up as a Hispanic PK, a preacher's kid uh, in a Baptist church. And I'm currently a deacon at a Woodland Baptist church. So Did, ditto I, for me, but the Methodist. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of shared experiences, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. So I think the the I'm glad that we're that the our, our city is doing something like this because I think that your the city is providing a way to address this new normal uh, collectively. And the fact that spirituality is such an important part of the DNA of San Antonio, that this is this this vehicle that we're using today is an asset in being able to deal with crisis. So um, I think the other important part is that we're increasing awareness of time uh, that is in being spent in, in social connections. I mean, I'm certainly receiving more emails, more phone calls, uh, and I'm giving you know, a lot of phone calls and, and text, and you see the Facebook posts increasing, all kinds of things like that. And so uh, relationships are being nurtured, uh, hopefully. Uh, and uh, if they're being neglected, I hope that there's an increase of connections during this time. And now um, the, the, this question that we just kind of without thought think, how are you, uh, has a different meaning right now. The real question is, is how are you coping? How are you coping? Okay. Now, one of the things we're coping with today is technology. So, Patty, you're cutting in and out some for us. I know. I, I'm, I'm getting a message of your your internet is unstable. I went, oh no, <laughs> not right now. So, were you able to get any of that? Yeah, I think, I think we certainly got the gist of what you were sharing with us. Uh, Paul, will you speak to that as well? Why, why do this day of reflection? Why does it matter? You know, if you had asked me that question two years ago, I would not have had uh, much of an answer. Uh, up to that time, although I had been a social worker and uh, one of the uh, founding members of the Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, reflecting wasn't my strong point. Um, it was about a year and a half that I uh, came across a flyer for people who were in the second half of their lives. And I thought, well, I certainly most likely qualified. And it was for a program that was starting anew at the Oblate School of Theology, uh, which as many of you know, is a fairly progressive Catholic uh, school that is very welcoming of Catholics and non-Catholics alike. And uh, so I enrolled in the program, it's called Forest Dwelling. And it's, I've been in it about a year and a half now. And much of it has been uh, enabled me to think about the importance of spirituality, mysticism, reflecting, things again that I hadn't spent much time doing so in that sense, uh, I'm much better prepared uh, now to contribute than I was then. Um, I, I have to say that uh, of the various traditions that I'm now exposed to, 
um, the, uh, re the writings and the uh, YouTube uh, videos by uh, Father Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R, uh, have been very influential and very uh, welcoming uh, for, again, where I am in terms of my own reflecting. And what difference does it make to reflect? Hmm. What difference does it make? Well, good point. I, I was thinking, for example, of uh, the current situation and the discussion about social distancing. And when I began to think about it, I realized that that was a misuse of, of words. Social distancing isn't what we are trying to achieve during this period, but it's physical distancing. If anything, socially, we want to be even better and more strongly connected, whether it's by telephone or online or by Zoom. Uh, it's um, keeping a physical distance means uh, not that uh, I don't care about you, but that I, it, it means I care about you, not that I fear you. And so I think it's important again that when we look at the words that we use, uh, it's uh, that we, we think through and reflect upon their meaning. Uh, one of the recent controversies, for example, was the relabeling of the virus in using uh, a, uh, a uh, term which had reflected on Asians as an example. Uh, and uh, you know that could be a real problem uh, for a number of reasons. And that a number of people apparently have uh, chosen to pick on folks who look Asian and blame them for the uh, current uh, uh, pandemic uh, that has all sorts of problems involved with it as an example. Good point, because when we reflect, we practice that spirit of reciprocity of what is it we want to send into the world that we want to come back to us. Mm -hmm. And I think you make a really good point, Paul, that when we stop and think, how would we feel if we were being targeted, if we being anyone targeted for something we had nothing to do with, no, no culpability whatsoever. So it is so important to think about what our words are and the difference and the power that they can hold both for good and for ill. So in thinking about why a day of reflection is important, would any of you want to share about how that might be impacting uh, the idea of reflection can be impacting the people closest to you? Do you have any examples of how it may, has made a difference for someone? I, well, I, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Abel. But go ahead, Patty, then I'll go. <laughs> uh, I, and hopefully I'm not cutting it out. I apologize for that. It just keeps popping up. Your internet is unstable. But I think, you know, Wendy, one of the examples that I'm seeing in regards to the impact and, and those, you know, near and dear to us, I, I'm just thinking about whenever I drive in and out of my community and you see a lot more people outside as they're walking uh, as family or, you know, individually walking. And there is that need to connect through a wave or through a smile or before, I mean, that might have been just, okay, they're walking. And so whether I'm in a car or I'm doing the walking, that uh, there's a need to recognize uh, because we're, we're not able to do that uh, currently. And so now it's the, the before when you're passing someone and they're going to cross the street, it used to be, oh my gosh, they don't want to be near me. Now it's a protective sense of, okay, I'm going to cross the street so that we, we maintain our distance, but there's still a smile or a wave or, or a question of, you know, nice weather or something like that. So I think that, uh, uh, that, that, that need to connect, we're reminded about how important that is. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, I really appreciated the other day when I came out of my front door in my little neighborhood, um, a couple of young guys were walking their dogs and they weren't people I'd ever met before, but they both paused and they looked to me yes. and said, hey, you doing okay? Yes. And 
I really felt that it wasn't just a pleasantry that they really wanted to know, are you okay? Mm -hmm. and, and it meant a lot. Abel? It, it, well, and I was gonna say, that's a seedbed for, for building community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Patty. Abel, what were you going to share? Yeah, well, no, I think what was mentioned earlier just came, what came to mind for me is this, this sense of proxies, you know, just this, this rhythm of action, reflection and action. And so, because Perhaps now we're we're um, in moments of of deeper reflection. You know, does that begin to frame our actions? You know, even when you think of now how the church is, uh, you know, shifting to virtual connecting. Uh, you know, or finding ways to to be of service to others. Uh, you know, I, I think um, in safe ways. Uh, so that's what comes to mind. Uh, just on a personal note, uh, you know, my my uh, I'm a former. Peace Corps volunteer in the Philippines, uh, served uh, in the 80s. And so uh, my wife is from there. And so we live in this uh, kind of uh, two worlds <laughs> that are 12, 13 hours apart, you know, in time. But, but as she connects back home, so we, we really, you know, coupled with the news, really are seeing the impact of the pandemic, but yet, you know, just that, that need to, to have closeness as a family. Uh, you know, and so I think just through those conversations, uh, you know, of staying connected, you know, are, are, you know, aspects of reflection, you know, just, just caring for each other in that way. And I'll circle back to Paul at this point and ask um, in the big picture, and I'll start with the big picture in San Antonio and then maybe zoom out from there. But Paul, how do you see reflection and maybe this particular day of reflection as having an impact here in San Antonio. This may be getting very specific in terms of uh, the power of reflection. Uh, and as a social worker uh, with a uh, interest in uh, preventing domestic violence, uh, my concern is that fears about our future based on the uh, pandemic uh, and isolating families may result in higher rates of uh, domestic violence and child abuse and neglect. Those, those are things that uh, I'm sure our protective services folks uh, are very uh, alert, alerted to and uh, may be concerned about. We may not hear about it right away, but I think eventually we will. And in addition, uh, those kinds of conditions will be affecting persons recovering from, from addiction. I think who will need to take a special, uh, special care as will their family members in helping them make sure they don't fall off the wagon. Uh, those are certainly two uh, social issues that uh, as social workers we, we, we are very familiar with. And again, it's a different way of reflecting, but it then brings to surface those, uh, um, those behaviors that uh, uh, while evident uh, in normal times, I think become even more critical during periods like this. And, and since I have the three of you to visit with on the topic of uh, reflecting and your roles in social work and social justice, Etc. How can we collectively, individually, help those who are most in need during this period? What are your recommendations? What would you have us do? Well, we certainly have uh, increased our appreciation for the healthcare providers, for um, first responders, um, and then in the field of social work, we're I mean we're thinking about those who are taking care of children who can't be in their homes, uh, whether they're adolescent or young children or foster parents, all those, and the kind of care for them. So one, I think one that we can easily do from our home is, um, uh, is to pray. Pray for them uh, mm -hmm. and remembering them as we come across uh, in our path, whether we see them shopping at the store or something, is to say thank you for your service uh, and just, uh, um, you know, give them support uh, in, in that sense and protecting them. 
Uh, the other part, um, Wendy, is, is uh, using our natural resources, whatever connections we may have to either how can we support you because we have that connection uh, with a particular social service agency uh, or, uh, or, or through our congregations. Is there something that we can do collectively? Uh, I, I know, I mean, we hear about the desperation of the need for the surgical masks and uh, is there something that we can do there? I do know of several initiatives that are happening with that and that women are mobilizing uh, to put those together. Uh, so, I, you know, so I would basically wrap, you know, say with who do we already have connected with that we can say, how can we help you? Thank you. Paul or Abel? And the, well, I, yeah, just real quick. So I think what comes to mind, uh, just, you know, is listening to Patty is just, yeah, this, this uh, heightened, heightened connection, uh, just, you know, as say worship services are connected, you know, via Facebook, or you just, you know, as needs are expressed, uh, you know, then, then you find responses occurring. So there seems to be this manifestation, you know, just, just the connecting of the community uh, starts to maybe organize and mobilize the community uh, to, to, you know, to reach out to each other or to support each other. Mm -hmm. Well, the issue of domestic violence has come up in several conversations yeah. today. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is at least the third hour I can think of where that topic has come up. And so given your all's area of expertise, I am wondering if you have any particular words to say to all of us in helping us know how to address um, the potential for domestic mm -hmm. violence in this, in this period. Mm -hmm. Well, I like to, so John Garland said earlier in, in the 11 o'clock hour in regards to um, just being aware and sensitive to uh, people in distress, uh, whether it's neighbors. Uh, I mean, obviously we can't go knocking at anyone's door uh, but just to, to notice uh, maybe a, an activity outside the home that doesn't make any sense and, and to trust that instinct, kind of like your, your neighbors did to you. Are you okay? Is everything going okay? Monitoring that response or things like that. Uh, and, and those that, and, and you know, one of the things he, he mentioned was, again, back to the natural, na natural networks. If you have always had some kind of concern about uh, that person within your congregation or maybe you know, in your social network uh, where they may be at risk is to reach out to them and say, hey, how, how's it going? I know that it may be a little difficult with something or other, you know, I'm here to help. Uh, and that there's a sense here, I'm available to you and I'm talking to my CPS friends uh, on what they're dealing with, because now there's not any other eyes looking at them like through the school, the school system or congregation. Uh, it's a little bit more challenging right now. And so it's a collective, we all need to pay attention to this. Yes, granted. And, you know, again, we're encouraged to know that the first line responders are still in place and we can make those calls if there's really a heightened concern as well. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. It's also uh, what we know about our family members uh, that's so important. Uh, most of us know cousins, uncles, uh, and other uh, in-laws that uh, may have difficulties with drinking or, or with abuse. And uh, perhaps under usual circumstances, uh, we can... Uh, assume that they're going to take care of it because they can go their separate ways or there's always uh, protective services that can be called. But it seems to me that it would be useful to reach out to some of these relatives to let them know that if uh, they're in need of, uh, well, for example, if some of the kids are getting on their nerves, um, you know, uh, why not send the kids over and play with my kids? for a while until that the situation passes. Or if there's a family member who's drinking too much, uh, perhaps until that passes uh, or he or she falls asleep, uh, there's a way of making sure that the other members are not um, 
in the don't don't get in the way uh, in terms of being in any danger. Uh, those are certainly cer certain things that we can do to help. Um, it's interesting that with the uh, current situation, our churches, many of our churches have gone to online services. Uh, that's been an, really an exciting development. I have happened to have a happy hour group uh, and um, they're going to be setting up a happy hour meeting uh, tomorrow afternoon um, and ask me because of my involvement with Zoom to help set that one up. Uh, that's gonna be fun. And it's going to be interesting because here the group normally gets together Thursday at five o'clock at one of the local restaurants, but now they're going to be in their own homes um, and celebrating. And the question is, can, is there a way in which we can set it up so that they can socialize uh, at a distance? And so that kind of creativity, it seems to me, uh, is uh, what uh, can evolve from kind of situation that we're facing now. The other thing is that we have so many wonderful social groups uh, that uh, at, at church and otherwise, sewing groups, quilting, um, and other uh, uh, fiber arts that may want to consider uh, contacting the local uh, a medical society to find out if they can uh, use some of their skills and their time to create, for example, masks that could be used by our health professionals. In that way, they are continuing to uh, do something very constructive and are contributing to our overall, overall community health as well. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I'd, like, I'd like to add something that I, I saw, I was looking, scrolling through the and it reminded me that another avenue in regards to reaching out to distressed families is that you know our, our teachers our san antonio teachers are doing a good job in 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 reaching out to their students um and uh now second graders have telephones i mean now you know that everyone's got access to that is that um their creative way of, of reaching out to them, say, if you need to talk to someone, if you're feeling a little sad or you're feeling worried or something and you want someone to talk to, that could be another avenue for, for uh, a child because they trust their teacher, they know their teacher, uh, it can you know contact them. And again, how they're doing that, it's up to the teacher. But I think that's another avenue. And I'd rather, again, uh, uh, because the, all the resources, the child abuse hotline number is still, is still working. And uh, it doesn't say you have to prove abuse. You know, you're, by law, we just report it. We don't have to, but you know, who knows that a teacher can say, it just doesn't sound right. I don't, it, this child was never, my student was not like this. And I'm just gonna report it, you know, and it's, and it's anonymous, uh, but who knows? You know, it could be something because of the fact that uh, we're sequestered at this time. That could be another avenue of uh, helping families in crisis. Well, segueing a little bit, and thank you all for such wisdom and insight in how we can be each other's brother and sister during this period in particular. But thinking in terms of some of the creativity that has already been mentioned in addressing where we are and how we move forward. I want to ask you, what are sources of wisdom and actions and as people of faith, I would say rituals, whether they're faith rituals or even if they're just your own personal rituals, what are creative things that you glean from to give you um, focus and hope during this period or in life in general. And I'm going to start with Abel. I haven't heard from him for a couple minutes. So I'm going to go back to Abel. Well, I think uh, one of the reflections and I actually uh, received this from, a, from another uh, reflection was just, um, I, I guess maybe reclaiming the Sabbath <laughs> and in the sense that, you know, just uh, the pace of, that, of the world and uh, and I guess the brokenness of Sabbath, and so now we're 
in essence, needing to um, step into this and and um, and 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 restore it uh, just out of practice. So, so I think that 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 ties back to um, reflection and and just how you know how might we be different, you know, uh, as a city, as a country, um, you know, out of, out of coming out of this time. Um, just on a personal note, I've been taking just afternoon walks through the neighborhood. So I think that was mentioned earlier about just now starting to, you know, see my neighborhood uh, in a different way, but also just, you know, those walks as, as times for, for reflection uh, and rest. And let me back up just a moment, Abel, knowing that we are broadcasting to many, many people. Could you address what you mean by Sabbath? Yeah, so so Sabbath in, in terms of, uh, you know, God's design for rest, you know, and restoration. Uh, and so, uh, so in that, you know, I think that, um, um, you know, it, it's just, just uh, getting back to the intent of that, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate you for making sure that we're all on the same page with what we're talking about. Let, let me add something to uh, what Abel was saying. Uh, this certainly is uh, um, a respect for the various seasons. And uh, at this point, uh, if you go to your local nursery, you realize that this is a time when they're expecting you to come by and pick up those tomatoes and various plants and so forth and uh, replenish your gardens. Um, that's, I think, an excellent way of, uh, uh, you know, for you to, when you have the time, and now you do have the time to be able to do what you've always wanted and plant what you've always wanted and to replant and to replant and to do that for your neighbors as well. Uh, and one other way, in addition to supporting your local nursery, is supporting your local uh, favorite uh, restaurants. The um, carry-out uh, menu is is you know uh, is something that is encouraging uh, places to stay open. Uh, I drove through the hill country yesterday, for example, and decided to stop for lunch in Bandera. And of course, what I was looking for was barbecue. And what I ended up with some of the best tasting Chinese food uh, at a carry out uh, in downtown Bandera than, that I've uh, had in this area. So again, supporting your local businesses uh, in a safe way uh, makes a lot of sense. So interesting actions that, that you're offering and creative thoughts. Um, Thinking in terms of words of wisdom, what are some of the words you have hidden in your hearts that made you ready for this period? Not that suddenly these words mean something to you, but they've always meant a lot to you. And by way of example, one of my favorite passages is found in the book of Exodus where Moses is trying to figure out what this burning bush is about. And, and he has this dialogue with God and there is the phrase, I am that I am. And those words just so resonate in my soul to know that I'm not in charge. It's not up to me that I have my responsibility, but ultimately I can lean on the creator God. So, so what are words that have carried you through life to prepare you for this time? I, well, for, for me, I think uh, just, you know, reflecting on, um, I guess, the diff different names of God, you know, for example, Jehovah Rapha, God who heals, or Jehovah Jireh, God who provides, or Jehovah Shalom, God who gives perfect peace. And so that, that I think that frames for me, my prayers and just uh, prayers for others, prayers for the world, uh, but also just kind of realizing that that God is is all of those things for us, you know, in various times, given times of circumstance or situations. 
uh, and and then when I think of shalom, uh, you know that perfect peace or or uh, the abundance of God, uh, you know I just I think and you know also in the context of just community. So so just in this time as we're having the reshaping of society, uh, you know uh, shalom still rings true. You know it may just kind of show us how to step into that. So uh, I'm hopeful in this. Uh, you know, as as we learn through this. Thank you, Patty. What are what are the wisdom words in your heart? Oh, Patty may be having internet problems. Yeah, I think she stepped out. She might have stepped out trying to get back in. I don't know. Okay, okay. Paul. Yes. Uh, in fact, you mentioned wisdom, and it was a sermon during the last year that helped me rethink. Uh, a number of things. Uh, it was uh, uh, Pastor Anna Gordy, someone that several of us know, uh, who was drawing upon the uh, Old Testament. And what she referred to was Sophia, wisdom, and the feminine side of God. And that, that sermon struck me so strongly that from that time forward, whenever I've been asked to give a grace or an invocation, um, what naturally comes to my, my, my mind and my speech are the words mother and father God. And I feel very comfortable with that, that idea. Uh, and friends, uh, no one has had any problems with it. And friends of mine who share grace uh, often include that as part of their grace as well. And I certainly welcome it. Uh, it seems to me that it has brought into my life a balance that has always been there, but has never been spoken. And now I can speak it freely. Thank you. And Patty, you're back. Yes, I just died on me. I just got kicked out somehow. So, so I'm on my iPad now. So mm -hmm. sorry about that. So what we're asking is, what are words of wisdom that have brought you to this spot? You know, what's prepared you as far as uh, wisdom that you hang on to for times like this? Well, uh, so as far as what has prepared me for times like this, it's definitely my life, my, my profession as a social worker, because, I mean, we walk into crisis left and right, and they're not necessarily of our making. Uh, so so um, I'm reminded often uh, that I don't control this. I am not in charge. Um, I, in social work, client self-determination, they decide how they're going to uh, address their challenges, address their issue. So, uh, so that you know, first and foremost is the reminder that I I don't I don't dictate. Uh, I don't do this. So that's a huge relief when you think that the so you know the solution is not up to you. And the other is that um, God has always gone before me. He's he was involved with that family or involved with that individual before I ever came on board. And um, he's he's the one, the Holy Spirit is working in their lives and orchestrating that I'm an instrument. I may or may not be a part of the, re, the positive result or uh, uh, an action that helped resolve the situation. So, so certainly I've had a lot of uh, experience, <laughs> experience with that, walking in and out of um, families' lives or individuals' lives and, and dealing with the crisis and, and learning pretty quickly that I don't have any magic words for this or any magic solutions. So um, um, it was, it was, I mean, like I said, I've had lots of practice with that. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. So along the lines of rituals, we, we spoke about taking walks, doing things maybe a little differently. And earlier when I was privileged to host um, some of our Muslim neighbors, they were saying how important the five times of prayer are daily for them and organizing their lives around those, those five pillars. Are there any religious rituals that are particularly taking on a new, a new meaning uh, for you during this period? 
Paul? Hmm. Well, other than the one that I mentioned about uh, how I begin my prayers, uh, I would say that I, I use that those words not only for graces and for invocations, but for my personal prayers as well. And that has, again, uh, helped to broaden my way of uh, viewing uh, divine help and the kind of help I can draw upon to be of help to other people as well. Well, and I would interject something that happened accidentally for me and you know we're all washing our hands 20 minutes 20 minutes it feels like 20 minutes Sometimes. 20 seconds at a time and someone shared with me that as a christian i'm very accustomed to the lord's prayer well i didn't know that it times out at about 20 seconds oh. so it has now become my ritual that as I wash my hands, I focus on my hands and pray the Lord's Prayer as a means to count the 20 seconds. But it has taken on a really rich meaning for me that that cleansing that's happening and that connection that I have with people worldwide as a ritual that didn't start in um, faith it's other than the faith of getting rid of the germs but <laughs> has become a real faith ritual for me many times a day in seeking to pray instead of singing happy birthday over and over we have some, there's some uh, congregations too who are exploring common hymns amazing grace one um verse of that is 20 seconds we're going to turn the chat room on just so you know so Okay. Well, and thanks for, for that, uh, uh, adding, speaking of adding diversity to washing hands. And I'll have to, I'll remember that instead of doing the happy birthday song. <laughs> um, I think one for me in, in regards to, I'm not sure if it's as much a, a ritual as it is a, a, a faith practice, is that in the mornings as I'm, as I'm waking up, I start doing, I've at, now that I don't have to jump out of bed and head off so early, I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing my exercises in bed. I'm doing a lot, I've added, increased my stretches. And so while that's on, uh, I put on the radio and listen to uh, pastors, teachers who are positive. And they're not just dealing with the coronavirus and you know, faith in God. I mean, they're just reminding me of stories of faith, stories of resilience, stories of uh, how God just continues to work to work while I'm stretching and, you know, pulling, pulling my muscles this way and moving them that way, uh, that I've become that, well, actually, I actually started that practice before the issue of the virus came, but, uh, it's been very helpful because my morning starts with, okay, God, you got it. Yeah. And I think that's so valuable in, in all of it you said, but it, specifically referring to the statement that you listen to positive messages yeah. and your full day from morning till night is not just COVID-19. Right, exactly. Not to take a mental break yes. from that heaviness. It's not that we don't have to be paying attention and doing our part, but we also have to remember life is bigger than just this issue. Well, I think, I think also what just comes to mind is this awareness of just practicing patience because we're having to maybe, you know, pick up, do some things differently. And so how do we grow in patience uh, with, with this, which, which adds to just, you know, how things are slowing down and maybe causing us to, to think about that more. Yes, absolutely. Moving on, because we're in the last 15 minutes or, or less, and we do have the chat a feature open. So if any of you are listening in and you'd like to ask a question of our uh, panel, then please do, please do. And thinking in terms of your expertise, the three of you, what is the, the message you want to convey to your fellow San Antonians right now? What's the one thing you want them to know? 
And Abel, your your face is what I'm seeing, so that means you get to talk first. Okay. Um, I I think it's it's um, well, you know, from a church perspective, but just this this what it means to be non anxious, and uh, because I think that there's for where people may be stressing or are stressing out or anxious and unsure, it's just you know. Um, those that can can maybe um, offer listening, uh, you know, listening, you know, becomes uh, things to pray for, but just that uh, just that non anxiousness uh, presence, I guess, if you will, that then offers encouragement. So not so much, uh, yeah, just may, maybe offering that. And so um, I, I and I think that ties to um, you know just the essence of you know, through the faith-based initiatives of, you know, just a compassionate city, uh, you know, so, so that, that would be, you know, my word. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would add on to that, um, you know, what I said earlier, is there a reminder that uh, God is, is uh, I mean, because we're slowing down, we had to slow down, uh, but this is the opportunity for um, allowing God to just fine tune this during this time, How, however that's defined. Um, he, you know, allowing him to work his divine self in you and, uh, and that use this time to either get to know him better or to strengthen the relationship. Uh, I would, I would, my message for everyone would be to keep praying and wash your hands. Uh, and uh, I wanted to use the, um, the contemporary English version of the, of the Psalms 23 uh, uh, first three uh, verses that is pretty familiar to us, but the, but this, Contemporary English version says, you, Lord, are my shepherd. I will never be in need. You let me rest in fields of green grass. You lead me to streams of peaceful water, and you refresh my life. You are true to your name and lead me along the right path. And just a reminder, God's got it. Well, thinking of, again, the fact that all of you were very intimately involved with uh, families and lives and uh, across the city. Are there things we can learn from me, our, our cultural diversity that can help each other? And maybe that's too broad a question, but it just occurs to me that there might be things that if I only knew something that was practiced in a different community, it might be helpful for me. Like today hearing and be re being reminded of of the Muslim call to prayer five times a day and organizing life around prayer, that, that was very helpful for me to think of in terms of how am I organizing my time? Any thoughts on that particular topic? And even though I might've thrown you a curveball. Well, actually I was thinking of the previous uh, one as well. And that is uh, the saying that uh, uh, how we learn from others is watching what they do, not just what they say. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it's an added pressure. We continue to be models for the people around us, uh, our loved ones, family members, and so forth. And so, you know, how we behave, how we respond uh, to what they're asking for, uh, how we act under pressure, um, uh, what happens is when something you know, tragic happens that how we respond to that is what we're teaching others as well. And I think I would like to remember that that added pressure continues. And one hopes that uh, uh, it's a reflection of God in you that you're conveying as well. Excellent, thank you. Hey, Wendy, this, this popped into my silly head is that, um, so culturally, Latinos are in major distress right now and anybody who's a hugger because our physical distance is so tight. And so not to be able to reach out and li literally physically touch each other, we're in a cultural crisis. So be sensitive to that. <laughs> we do have a question um for everybody 
Am I correct in this group? We don't have clergy persons. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, correct. I'm not a clergy. Yeah, correct. Okay. Just so do I, me in. Uh, okay. So this one, uh, the host. I went to seminary before I came to know social work. Do you have one thing specific from social work that clergy and faith leaders need to know? I think a great marriage, because I did go to seminary before I, I had my social work degree and, and or got them simultaneously. So I, you know, one of the best practices that I would encourage this person is combining both those strengths to support and help each other is that how do we practice our faith within our social work practice? And at the same time, how do we help our church connect uh, outside the walls of the, uh, of their, of their congregations? And they're forced to do that now. I mean, they're having to think creatively instead of stressing over, Oh no, we don't have a building to go to. So how do we minister outside the walls of the church? So I think, you know, with the strengths and skills that this person has, that uh, they can hold those holy conversations, because it will, in some congregations, it's a stretch. Uh, and so it may have to start with the very, very basics of how did Jesus do this? He, did, he, did, he Most of the time, he was outside the sanctuary. He, he practiced ministry where the people were. So how, what would that look like in our context? So I think that's a great question and just a great time to have conversations like that with congregations. Yeah, I, and I'd, I'd say I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a social worker. Actually, my background is architecture and I'm working for the church, but, but I just think of just, yeah, we're in this time of heightened uh, uh, community engagement, the role that the church plays in engaging the community and uh, with, which is tremendous opportunity now it's done virtually, but out of it, you know, what, what how does it begin to uh, give us insight to um, further and greater engagement, you know, as, as we get maybe on the other side of this? Abel, you're a church and community specialist. That's who you are. <laughs> yeah. So, but that, that's just what comes to mind. Yeah. And so we thank you, Abel, for helping us build our community. Yeah. Thank you. Integrating your skills. And Paul, did you want to answer that question about that integration of, um, of seminary and social work? Yes. Um, one of my challenges when I went through uh, the uh, School of Social Work happened to be West Virginia University after I had spent a year in the mental health system in West Virginia. Uh, was being able to uh, hold on to my own religious beliefs while being open and accepting of clients who had yeah. other religious beliefs. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's not as much a challenge nowadays for me, but it, I think, uh, is something that uh, I would encourage folks who are going through seminary training to remember. They don't have to uh, deny or diminish their own beliefs while being open and accepting of others who come from different traditions. Yeah, very well put. And just a little FYI, I also hold a social work degree. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you knew that. Circle. But, yeah. <laughs> so what would you say, Wendy, from both seminary and social work, what do our our faith leaders, our civic leaders, what, what can learn from social work? What can be learned from theological work? What? Well, I think it's really important, whatever your uh, particular expertise may be, that it becomes integrated holistically with who you are and particularly in what we're talking about as a person of faith. I mean, we saw that earlier with Sumera Tech that she very she has a very integrated physicist who is a woman of faith. You know, there it's not this and that. And so I think that's certainly the case as well that as social workers, we are very informed by our faith and vice versa. Now, if your study has been 
um, divinity per se, but not in social work, then sorry about that. You kind of missed out. Uh, I will say <laughs> that when I asked a professor, a seminary professor, when I was still in high school, what should I study in college? He told me to study social work for that exact reason, because I expected later to go to seminary. So the big issue there was integrating the understanding like Paul was saying of everybody's not going to be on the same page you are, not all gonna see things the same way. And that's an incredibly valuable lesson for a faith leader, but also to look at the systems. What are the systems involved in any one given situation in the per person's lives? and that we don't live in a vacuum or a closed system, that there are so many overlapping issues involved. And so I've certainly found that to be very valuable in faith leadership as well. Mm -hmm. Which is a great transition into our next hour. So thank you all for coming and your insights.